Glory to God. Bless the Lord. Come on, shout another praise to the Lord Jesus. Oh, we magnify his name. Glory to God. Dominion Conference. Glory to God. Go ahead and be seated. Oh, I'm glad I am here with you tonight. I know you've been having church. I did not do what I said I was going to do earlier. That's right under your car. There we go. Thank you. I need all the help I can get. Well, that will help you. Thank you. I love this ministry. I really do. We've known, as Pastor already said, we've known one another for a lot of years. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be counted among this church's friends and among your pastor's friends. But you know, we're on assignment. Each one of us are. And I believe this, this week of meetings is assigned by the Lord to do a variety of things. I believe God has always made it clear, this isn't new, but he's always made it clear that he was about getting into the very fabric of our life and changing us from the inside out so that things would be supernatural in our life. God didn't make us. Oh, I'm glad I said what I did uh, on the video you guys just showed. Well, that's been a while ago, I guess, but uh, we weren't made to be average. That's right. God made us in a way where we would reflect the greatness of God. We were made for big things and yet life and many times people find a way to, to just grind it out of us. But it doesn't have to stay out of us. And that's why a conference like this is so vital. And I trust you've taken advantage of it. I know they've Recorded it. You can certainly get the, the CDs and go through it again. But in the next few minutes, I, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do something fresh to breathe on every one of us so that there's an impartation. Because in the end, what we're really after is not just more information. We're not looking for just inspiration. What we're really looking for is an impartation of revelation from the Spirit of God so that things are different for us. Amen. That's what this week, I think, is designed for, that things would be different. How many of you think change is a good thing in your life? How many of you actually think that there are some changes yet to be made in your life? How many of you think that? How many of you won't raise your hand no matter what I ask you all night? Let's just clear the air. I know it happens. That's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm a secure guy. <laughs> but I believe this. I really do. I believe that God orders my steps in yours. And so I want to jump off into some things now that uh, I believe will have uh, just that right kind of impact in your life. Glory to God. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. We invite you, as you've already been invited all week, to do what you would in our midst. I'm asking you, Lord, to use me, that I would minister with clarity and accuracy the things that you placed in me, that I'd follow the river that you have laid out before me. And Lord, I thank you that each one of us tonight have eyes that see into the things of God, ears that hear what the Holy Spirit is saying, that in our heart we really do grab it, embrace it, make it our own. And that this would be a revolutionary few minutes in the presence of God. Show yourself strong in our lives. Holy Spirit, we are just so honored to have you in our presence and in our midst. We're so grateful to you, Holy Spirit, that you've come tonight even to restore people. You've come to change us. You've come to empower us. You've come to enlighten us. You've come to affect us. You've come to infect us. You've come to revolutionize our world. And God, we are so, so interested in all of those things. So we thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I also want to thank you, Pastor, for having vision to do this every year. Um, all through Scripture, particularly if you were to go through the book of Acts, for example, 
you would find that there were significant meetings. There were meetings that took place where significant things happened. Where the Holy Spirit was able to say things to people in those meetings that while we know the Holy Spirit speaks all the time, there's something that happens when we come together in a time like this and just meet. <laughs> but we don't meet just with each other. We don't meet just with a speaker. We really do meet with the Holy Spirit. And he's come to do some things in this meeting tonight. So look, I want you to open your Bible to the book of Romans. I want to jump right into some things that God has given me so clearly that I believe we'll have just the right impact on you tonight. There's all through the Bible, you know, there are some big names in the Bible. Lots of big names. They're big names to us anyway. Names like Moses, that's a big name. <laughs> Glory to God, what God did through Moses. Elijah, there's a big name. Elisha, there's a big name. The various prophets, those are all big names. Of course, Jesus is the biggest name. Amen. The name Amen. above every name. Right. Paul is... A big name in the Bible, but I want to talk to you about one of the other big names of the Bible, maybe one of the biggest anyway, and that is King David. I found this, I found the Holy Spirit will target some things in me, and he'll use particular people in Scripture many times to help me catch a big picture of what God has wanted to do and what he's wanted to do on an individual basis as well. And I saw some things in the life of King David that really came on the, on the heels of, of a day when I read a statement in Scripture that I really didn't understand. How many of you ever read things in the Bible you don't really understand? I, I feel uh, the warmth of that. You know, it just happens. And man, I've been walking with God a long time, but there's still things. You just see it and say, what is that all about? And I read this statement from the book of Revelation, actually, chapter 3, where Jesus is speaking to one of the seven city leaders of the seven different cities and churches in the book of Revelation. Now, I realize I told you to go to Romans, but now I'm quoting from Revelation. Just keep up. And... Uh, <laughs> And here's what Jesus said in the course of what he was saying to that church and to the leadership there. He said, uh, I am he who is holy, he who is true. And then here it was, he who holds the key of David. All right, let's go ahead and read it. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 3. We'll start there. Verse 7. And he said unto the angel, and actually that word could have been translated messenger in some places it is. I believe he was really speaking uh, to the leadership of that church in Philadelphia, which, by the way, is not in Pennsylvania. Uh, not this one. It's actually in modern-day Turkey. And uh, he said to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, says he is holy, he is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. For I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. He goes on to say some other things, but uh, out of those two verses, the Spirit of God started me on a track about this open door that God has given to each one of us. God has opened a door to you. And here's what he said. It is a door that no one can shut. Yes. There's going to be a lot of things that that can mean to us. But he said, I have opened a door and no one can shut it. You know what? That even includes you yourself. God has opened a door you can't even shut yourself. He's opened some things to us. And what he's calling you and me into is into a higher level of participation with him so that what he has opened to us, we're actually stepping into. Good. You know, it's not really enough to know that God has opened something to you unless you actually go in and, and actually possess it. You know how that things go in Scripture. 
God had told Israel that they were possessors of a land, that promised land, and yet there were people that never saw that promised land. Though they lived in the time frame where they could have and should have, they never did see it. They didn't possess it. God said, go get it. They said they couldn't. They said there's giants over there. It's too tough. It's too hard. It's going to be too difficult. There's too many obstacles, too many reasons we can't. You know, excuses are uh, everywhere, aren't they? Some people are masters of excuses. And yet, though there are a lot of reasons that people don't possess things that God gives them, there really is no excuse. Oh, I'm glad you're excited about all this. So, uh, here's what he said. Here's the statement that grabbed me. He said uh, of himself, Jesus said, he was the one who holds the key of David. I read that one day and I realized I had no idea what that meant. He's the one who holds the key of David. What is the key of David? Surely it has something to do with things that have been opened. A key opens, unlocks, locks, has to do with doors. You get the, the metaphor, but when he said the key of David, it sparked something in me that I began to listen to the voice of the Lord about what this key really was. Surely if it's a key, and if it's something Jesus thought was important enough to put in a deal like this, I think we ought to spend a little time figuring out what he's talking about. Yep. Amen. And I started to realize there was a, a tremendous affinity that Jesus' life and, and things that he said really uh, tied in with this King David. I realized that Throughout the Gospels, not one time is Jesus called the son of Abraham, although he could have been. You know, technically, he was one of the children of Israel. He would have been uh, called one of the children of Abraham. All of them were. And yet, not one time is he referred to as the son of Abraham, the father of faith. But 17 times, you find that he is called the son of David, born in Bethlehem, the city of David. And the very last statement that he gives us in Revelation chapter 22, he reminds us right there at the end that he is of the offspring of David. Man, this started to just get all over me. What in the world is going on here? And why would this be a big deal to us? You know, in the end, it's important to realize that when God's saying things to us, showing us things, what it's really all about is not just information. It's about something that's life-changing, yes. right. something revolutionary. Right. And so I want you to hear what we're talking about, even though there's a lot about David, a guy from ancient times, and yet truth is not ancient at all. And so to step off into some of these things, and then in the next few minutes we can't deal with all of it by any means, but we're going to deal with enough of it. I want to read from the book of Romans, which is obviously in the New Testament. But there's a statement here that the Apostle Paul gives us that comes right out of something David said, but there's a reason I want us to see it in Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. He said, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes what? Are you with me? This is open book. You can, you can answer now. <laughs> Let me try that again, just in case you missed that opportunity, but really want to participate. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes Righteous. righteousness apart from works. And then here's the quote from Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. You know, when Paul positioned it, he said it just a little different from the way David said it. This is important stuff. He said the blessing is on a person. You, all of us want the blessing of God in our life. You want it in your house. You want it in your money, you want it on the job, you want it in whatever you're involved in, man. We want blessing in our life. There's things that, 
that help connect us to this. There's things that prevent blessing in our life, but we all want it. Am I speaking for you or am I making this up? So here's part of what he said. Blessed or blessing is upon the one who knows that God is seeing them as righteous in his sight. That's what Paul says. Good. But here's what David said of the same idea, the same subject. He said, blessed is the one to whom the Lord does not impute sin. And while that ends up the same place, there's a distinct difference between the approach. One is about what we come out of. The other is about what we have come into. One is about what we have been delivered from. One, uh, the other is about what we have been delivered into. I did a study a lot of years ago now. But just through the book of Romans about a particular subject. I wanted to see something about sin. Now this wasn't going to be a how-to study. I was pretty clear on that. <laughs> but I wanted to see... Just this simple idea. How many times in the book of Romans alone, just the book of Romans, is the word sin a noun and how many times is it a verb? Now that may not sound like an exciting study, but let me help you through it. I found this out. I found that 47 times in the book of Romans the word sin is a noun. Now class, what is a noun? Person, place, or thing. This is one of the brightest crowds I think I have ever spoken to. Person, place, or thing. 47 times the Apostle Paul refers to sin as a place. The place of sin. Every one of us find ourselves in the place of sin. In the prison. In the cage. You can't get out of it. There is no getting out of this cage of sin. Every person is you can't do enough good things to get out of it. You can't go to church enough. You can't read enough from the Bible. You can't give away enough money. You cannot do enough to get out of the cage. Yet here's the, here's the amazing thing. This is a cage that has a door in it and the door is unlocked. Anyone could step out of this cage. Regardless of how they've been raised, what their religious beliefs are. Doesn't matter if they're Islamic, if they are Baptist, if they've been Catholic, if they're Hindu, if they're total heathen, couldn't care less about any of it. Any of them that are in the cage, and they all are, anybody can get out. Yep. If they simply go through the door. You know where this goes. Of course, Jesus himself is that door. So anybody can step out of the cage. And when you step out of the cage of sin, you step into Christ. Are you with me here? Yes. You step into Christ. So you got to come out to get in. How many of you are out of the cage? How many are out? Say it out loud. I'm out. Yes. How many of you are in Christ? Yes. See, it'd be all the same people, wouldn't it? So say it, I'm in. You see, so you got to be out in order to be in. So you get out, say it, I'm out. So I'm in. I'm out of sin, but I'm in Christ. Glory to God, that's good news. But now here's what I also found. Seven times in the book of Romans, the word sin is a verb. Now class, a verb is... It's an action. It's a behavior. It's something you do. And here's the amazing and some, some kind of twisted comfort comes from knowing that everybody has a few verbs in their life. <laughs> now look, you're a holy looking crowd. You've been in church all week. And something happens to people when they're in church as much as you've been in church. And I'm, I'm proud of you. But here's what we know about you. Now look, I could talk about me, but I didn't come to talk about me. I came to talk about you. So here's what we know about you. We know that there are still a few things that just don't look just like Jesus. They just don't look just like Jesus. They, 
you do when you're in church, man. We've got it down when we get to church. Everything's just right, man. Smile, we shake hands, we know just what to say, all the right things, because you learn the lingo. That is church culture. But get people out of this, and then it's back to the way they really are. <laughs> okay, maybe not this crowd. Maybe you are among the elite. But there'll be some right here in this building Sunday morning that are just like what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, here's the real truth of it. Nobody's doing everything perfectly. Everybody's got some issues, uh, some deal. Now look, this is not to say that that's okay. It's not. This is why the Holy Spirit keeps working in us, teaching us, because he wants maximum results in our life. But the real truth of it is, is that every superstar Christian you've ever known still has a few verbs. <laughs> we could use the word sin, but it just changes the whole flavor of the idea when you harp on sin. So something about verbs... Seems to lighten the load. Come on, give me a break. This is... So, we've got a few people, all of us, that do have a few verbs. And here's the thing you got to know. That having a few verbs left in your life at this stage does not throw you back into the cage. People walk with God and do great things, big things. And yet they still themselves have a few verbs in their life. What Satan has done effectively is done his work to convince people that they are unusable because they are not without sin. And Satan does his best to point out what those sins are. We're not talking about being in the place of sin. We're talking about the behaviors that don't just line up exactly right. Now some say, well, but Dennis, are you saying that's okay? That God is soft on sin? <laughs> no, no. No, no, God is not soft on sin. God is so not soft on sin that he sent his own son to die on the cross in order to eliminate it from your life. And he is still at work. Now that he's got you out of the place of sin. Now he's at work in your life to show you how far out of sin he's actually bringing you. Yes. God's not leaving you like you are. Aren't you glad? Yes. So David comes to this conclusion. Here's an amazing thing. David himself comes to the conclusion that the blessing of God is on the one who understands that God is not holding sin against them. Now David came by this truth in one of the darkest moments of his life. He'd caused more trouble. You know, David, I told you he's a big name in the Bible, but we're going to look at a few dark issues in David's life. Just one in particular, really, tonight. Not because we want to cast a dark shadow on David, but it's here in the Bible, man. we we got to learn some things from these guys. David came to understand something in this dark time in his life. You know what happened. If you've read your Bible much, you know what the history of it was. It was a time uh, when David was in the city while the men of war were out taking care of business and, and David should have been with them, I believe. But the Bible tells how he went out onto his balcony and how he looked across the way and his eyes fell upon a beautiful young lady as she bathed. Now look, I've always had questions about a woman that bathes out on her balcony. <laughs> in direct proximity to the king. So there could be issues there. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say, but she may have had her own agenda. We're just not clear on that. And apparently it's not important because God didn't make it clear, but I just thought I would speculate for a moment. <laughs> but regardless of what her agenda might have been, David is without excuse. And yet his eyes fell upon her. He wanted her. He got her. He had their, his men. He is the king. And they brought her to him. 
And the result of this was an adulterous affair in the conception of a child. David went into a, a cover-up mode. You know, that didn't start with the White House. <laughs> I think it went to some different levels, but at any rate, David started his own cover-up situation, did his best to cover his sin. Isn't that what anybody would do? Isn't that what you do? You don't go out broadcasting your verbs. <laughs> and if you want to know any of mine, you are going to find out from me. So what does David do? He dr brings in her husband. Oh yeah, by the way, she was married. Married young lady. Brought her husband in off the battlefield so he could spend some R&R &R time with his beloved Bathsheba. What uh, David hoped was that this would result in looking like a legitimate conception. What he wasn't ready for is that his own men had more integrity than he did. And he could not go into his own house while his comrades were out on the battlefield. And so David's plan A fell apart. It was plan B time. He handed this young man his order, sealed to take back to the commander of the army. And in that sealed directive to the commander was the instruction to put this man carrying this document forward for battle and draw the troops back so that he dies on the battlefield. David had this man murdered. Now look, under the law system that society lived with in that time, uh, God had initiated sacrifices and offerings so that people could continue in fellowship with God, though they were imperfect, and though they had not dealt with their sin, they could put an offering or a sacrifice out that would cover those sins. But there were two sins for which there were no offerings and sacrifices available. And David had found both of them. <laughs> no, the only thing that remained for David, and he would have known this, was he would be taken outside of the city by the elders and would be executed. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant. Amen. Well, that's the way it was. Adultery and murder, there was just no offering or sacrifice available. These people were to be executed by the elders, and that would include David. Well, one day after David had thought he had taken care of the whole situation, a knock came to his door, and it was the prophet Nathan. You know, the bummer about serving God, just as a little parenthesis here, the whole bummer about serving God <laughs> is that you, you don't, you, you don't, things don't get hidden. Yeah. It's all out there. <laughs> now, that's not really a bummer. I say it that way from a totally carnal point of view. <laughs> Only for those who would be so committed to covering their sin that it would appear to be a bummer. It's not a bummer, but it was for David at this moment when Nathan came to the door because God had sent him there with a word. Now here's another little parenthesis to my message, and it is this. If you're in sin and a prophet of God comes knocking at your door, here's my recommendation. Drop on your, your knees, cry out to Jesus before you open that door. Just a thought, but uh, David didn't get that. So he opened the door, Nathan came in. Nathan laid out a whole scenario that described a terrible situation within the kingdom. And uh, you remember what he said, it was just one of these moments. Finally, he pointed his finger at David and said, well, David, you are this, this man. And at that instant, David understood that what the law prescribed for anybody was about to fall upon him. But then he did something that was way different from what anybody in his situation had ever done. And this is one of the things that separates David and people like him from the average Joe. 
Because while David felt the weight of the moment, he also had already come to know certain things about God that nobody seemed to be talking about. And he began to write down a prayer. It took him some time, actually, and he wrote the 51st Psalm. Let's turn there briefly, and I just want to point out a couple of different passages of what David wrote as, as Nathan had confronted him about his sin. You still here tonight? Yes. First thing he said in verse 1, he said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Nobody was asking for that because his transgressions were not such that could be blotted out. And yet David cried out anyway. Cried out for the God of loving kindness and tender mercy. He had discovered something about God that was different from what others were saying. And he went ahead and laid it out before God. Verse 2, he said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. Isn't that what everybody really wants? Once, once you've had Jesus come into your life and you realize that how clean he has made your life, don't you realize right then just how, how dirty you were, how clean you are, and how you wished you had not waited so long? Amen. Man, David saw that there was a possibility of being clean. On the inside, watch how he goes on to say it. In verse 6, he said, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You will make me to know wisdom. Oh, he's already talking like he has a future. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. But then drop down into verse 16. He said something here that just rattled me one day when I read it. He said this. He said, for you do not desire sacrifice, or I'd give you one. You do not delight in burnt offerings. I read that, and I just had to pause, man. I said, wait a minute, David. Where do you get this? You're talking to God who started the sacrifices and offerings, and now where do you come up with the idea that he's not happy with it? He said, you don't even delight in the very thing you started. This is shocking. But what's even more shocking is that what we know about this is that David was exactly right. That's why it's, it's in scripture. He, he was correct. God was not happy with the old system. He didn't delight in the offerings and sacrifices, though God himself was the one that came up with it. Yep. Wow. That whole system was perfect. Here's the problem. There was sin in the people that would be in that system. That was the flaw that the law could never deal with. And David saw it. But when he saw that, he also saw that God... Wanted something more for people. That God was more about forgiveness than he was about punishment. That God is more about deliverance than he is a person's destruction. That God is more committed to healing and restoring than he is to driving them out. Glory to God. He always wanted to do these things for people. And David's the first one really in this way to press past his own condemnation and get over into this place in God. Good. He saw it. You see, here's the amazing thing. We've got believers today that sit in great churches that they themselves, even today, remain condemned over things in their life and stay disconnected from the very power of God that they're hearing ministered across these pulpits. 
They feel disqualified. They don't feel like it will be good for them. It's good for some. We hear what God does for others, but I don't feel like I qualify. I don't feel like I've done enough. I don't feel like I have participated. I don't think I believe quite hard or as good or whatever they think. <laughs> David went ahead and pressed past that. And what he literally did was he reached outside of the limitation of the age that he lived in. Outside of the limits of what the time he was in provided. And he reached into e eternal things. You I want you to follow this for a second. You see, time is part of creation. God is before, he's after, he's around. You know, eternity does not compute in your brain. It just doesn't. It's just, our brain is just not made for things like infinity or, or eternity. These, I mean, you know, while we say, yeah, 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 that's true, it just doesn't compute. God had to start somewhere. This has to end sometime. You see, but it doesn't. And then we go, oh, yeah, I know, but oh. we don't get it. <laughs> David reached out of what was available in his time and reached into the age to come. Wow. And he embraced forgiveness that would come through Jesus. Good. And he brought that to himself. Yep. He literally reached into the powers of an age to come by reaching into eternal things. And here's the real deal. Though Jesus wasn't going to come for hundreds of years, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis, how does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of them things, you know. Good. I don't know. And yet where this leaves you and me and where it left David was that there are things that we have the right to receive that we don't feel we qualify for. We haven't yet maybe done uh, what it, we thought it would take. And yet God wants us to receive based on what Jesus has done. David saw that. And what we know from history is that David was forgiven. He was not taken out and executed. From that point on as he wrote his letters or wrote his psalms, he was, he was the righteous. And that's who we are now, that we're in Christ. There was a second time in David's life. I want to give you a little more. Are you still here? Yes. yes. Come on. There was a second time in David's life where the prophet Nathan came to him. It's in 1 Chronicles 17. Only this time it wasn't about his sin. It was about something that God had had on his mind for a long time. Something God wanted to do. A plan that God wanted to unwrap. Now here's where this takes us. I'll give you a little bit of a preview and then we'll bounce back. But there are plans that God has for you right now. That we just barely know a few hints about. Things that God wants to do in you and through you that are so much bigger than where you are today. God has things that he's unwrapping in the body of Christ. You see, he has told us this. In Psalm 115, he has told us that the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Yep. The earth has been given to us. The psalmist said, what is man that you are mindful of him? You have made him a little lower than God. There are things that God has had on his mind for people that will only come out in our life when we take ownership of what he has given to us. And get off the casual Christian kind of thinking that revolves only around what God might do for me this week and gets over onto a bit more of how I can participate and walk hand in hand with God to be a part of his plan unfolding. Oh, we want God's plans unfolding in our life, but even through our life. And that's really what we are all about. That's what dominion is all about. Plans that are being unfolded and unwrapped. 
Oh, there's lots of things that try to interfere with those plans. Things that try to interrupt those plans. That's what David's whole challenge was, man. He was a great conqueror. He was a man of covenant. He was a man of great faith. And yet Satan did everything possible to derail him and get him off track onto anything else. Over the years, I've, I've had the privilege of working with lots of different leaders and churches and conferences and ministries of, of different types. And I've even watched his leaders find themselves in a lot of the same kind of places anybody else does, feeling inadequate, feeling that they have messed things up and they're never going to really probably see the real thing break loose like they wanted. And I had a conversation with one guy, and this kind of depicted part of it. I'd led several ministers. We'd gone on a, uh, oh, I don't know, about eight or ten motorcycles. We'd gone on some motorcycle ride, and I like to ride motorcycles. I ride a Harley, by the way. And uh, not that you care, but I thought you should know. <laughs> and um, so we'd gone for a ride and all this, and there was this one uh, couple that had come along. They'd never uh, been in this group uh, before. They'd been invited by one of the members of this organization and and uh but this couple came along it was their first time and and uh so it, at one point we had a little stop I, we made this little stop and and everybody's kind of milling around and you get guys on bikes and, and people want to talk and carry on and so we stopped it took a long time uh every time but uh, here was this one couple and I hadn't really gotten to have a conversation with them, so I just went up and I said, hey, man, tell me about yourself. Man, I want to get to know you guys. Tell me about your church. You know, people like to start there. And uh, that doesn't tell them about themselves. It tells them about their work. But you got to start somewhere. He told me later, and much later, he said, that the one thing I dreaded is that I was going to meet you and you were going to ask me about my church. Well, that was the very first thing that I asked him about. <laughs> Tell me about your church. He said, oh, I did not want to answer that. Because we had just gone through this major, major split. And he went on to tell me about all of the things that had gone wrong. People that had rose up, people that had left, it had just divided right down the middle and it was just a mess and, and he just took a few moments. We're standing on the side of a highway next to our motorcycles. We're getting ready to get back on our bikes and go ride and he just kind of regurgitated a variety of extremely serious problems that he had just been going through. Wow. And it was all on the heels of this, this major mess that had taken place in his church. And something just kind of dropped on me. I knew we, you know, you can't really go through a great deal here on the side of the road in the way it was going. I said, well, you know, when I think of stuff like this, you know, I, let me just tell you. God had a split in heaven. Yeah. And it wasn't due to a lack of leadership. Yeah. I said, well, hey, we got to go. So we got on... <laughs> We got on the bikes and, and we rolled. <laughs> he told me way later, way later. I mean, it's a year later before he actually told me what happened. He said, Dennis, he said, the moment you said that, he said, the anointing of the Holy Spirit came on me and everything I've been carrying lifted off of me. He said, it was... I mean, I was stunned. He said, I don't know if you noticed, but you went back, got on your bike. I was just standing there almost paralyzed. I said, you're right. I didn't notice. He said, I just asked God, oh God, let this happen to my wife right now. She's sitting on the bike waiting. She didn't hear this. She said, I walked back to her. I said, you got to listen to what Dennis Burke just said to me. God had a split in heaven and it was not due to a lack of leadership. He said the exact same thing happened to her. They had come to this thing heavy all of a sudden, standing on the side of the road in a moment's time, man. This whole thing had lifted off of them. Awesome. It just takes a moment for the word of the Lord to do something in us because we carry all of this stuff and God wants us to get past it because he's got things he wants to do that we prevent from even happening. David got this worked out in his life. 
He went on after that situation that we just looked at. He went on to uh, become that great king. The righteous. And when Nathan came to him once again, in 1 Chronicles 17, he had some things to say. God wanted to describe something to him that he needed to hear. David had been bent on building God a house. Building God a great temple, a great place. He had seen what the demon gods had. And David wanted to do something magnificent for the Lord. Now it's interesting because as Nathan first came, first thing out of the prophet's mouth was, uh, thus says the Lord, you will not build me a house. The thing David wanted to do so much, God wasn't even interested in at all. How many times do we get something in our head? We're going to do this for Jesus. <laughs> God's going to be so impressed with this. This is going to prove whatever else we're trying to do. And God could, really isn't interested in it at all. But God did have some things he was interested in. Let's pick this up in verse 7. Where he said, Now therefore, thus says the Lord, thus you shall say, that is to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep. I always get a <laughs> kick out of that line. David wasn't even leading sheep when God found him. He was following sheep. <laughs> He said, and God just has a way of telling it exactly like it is. Uh, I, got you, I found you following the sheep and I made you ruler over, the, over my people Israel. Verse 8. And I've been with you wherever you've gone, cut off all your enemies before you, made you like a name of great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I'll plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness Oppress them any more as previously since the time that I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel. Now watch this. All right, if you fade it out on that, fade back in. Watch this. <laughs> also, I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, everybody say furthermore. Furthermore. I will build you a house. Now we're going to start to really get to the nitty gritty. And it shall be that when your days are fulfilled, and you must go be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons. And I will establish his kingdom. How long? This is open book. Come on. Forever. Verse 12. He shall build me a house. I will establish his throne forever. Verse 13. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Oh, we're not talking about Solomon here. We're not talking about David's son. We're talking about God's own son. God is announcing something to David that he's never put in these terms before. He is declaring the biggest plan of all time. And that was the plan for the son of the living God to be born onto this planet and to start a new race of people. And he's saying all these things to David because David had come to embrace something where he would not let his sin paralyze him, but he went past it. Now watch how David responds to, well, let me finish verse 14. He said, I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. Now look at verse 16. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, who am I, O Lord God? Isn't that what you'd say if God talked to you like this? <laughs> Lord. And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet it was a small thing in your sight. You have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Now watch this next line. Because in this next line is something absolutely amazing. He said, and you have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree. Now, you know, at first that really doesn't sound all that impressive. I started to dig into that. Somehow, every once in a while, you've had it happen. A phrase just jumps off the page at you. This jumped off the page at me one day. When I saw this, he said... Just to quote him once again, you have regarded me according to the rank 
of a man of high degree. Well, now David's the king. He is a man of a high rank. But David said, you are regarding me according to the rank of somebody even higher. But in the Hebrew text, Adam Clark's commentary says it this way. In fact, Adam Clark's commentary said it actually is a miserable translation the way it reads right there. That it should have read this way. And you have regarded me according to the order of the Adam who is future. Or the man that is from above. David saw into eternity once again. And he saw into a plan once again. The reason this is important to you and me is because David saw this new race of people that would start in the last Adam, Jesus. He saw a race of people and he saw a system that God would introduce in order to do the biggest things that have ever been done. It was a system where God would work in people but not according to to the limitations of those people. That he would work in people just like David, just like you, just like me, not according to us, but according to the Adam, the second or last Adam, according to the one who is from above. Church, here's what God has been leading you and me into for our entire Christian life. But also what you find is he's been leading up to this from the very start. That God would have access to your life and my life. Not limited by our performance alone. But only limited by what we would choose to believe that God would do in our life. God's ready to heal the body of a person who chooses to believe that God wants them well. God is ready to exalt and to bring into a place of financial wealth. He's ready to do that in any person that will choose to believe that that is God's agenda in their life. David chose to believe that what God said through that prophet that day was exactly what God wanted for him. And that's exactly what God did. God established a throne on this earth. The biggest thing that's ever happened on this planet. David nearly missed the whole thing. You don't want to miss what God's planted you in this planet in order to have happen. And that's why I've taken this time tonight to take you through this history of David. Not all the parts and pieces. David discovered God wanted to be open to every person, not hidden in a holy of holies. One little tent that only one man saw once a year. God wanted to be out in the open where every person could come into his presence. And Jesus is that covenant Amen. connection for you and for me. Where you come into his holy presence. Whether you have been entirely holy or not. Now I want you to stand with me. Because we have come to do business here tonight. Satan has robbed and stolen from people. Satan has convinced people they do not have the right to receive on the levels that God has said he would or they could. And tonight, I've asked the Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see it. Because if you can see it, this is what God told Abraham many, many generations ago. If you can see it, you really can have it. He told Abram to walk the land so that he saw it so well. I venture to say you've been walking the land, so to speak, all this week. 
of things the Holy Spirit wants in your life and wants to have happen. Healings and restorations, freedoms and deliverance, where God's raising and lifting you up. This is what he did with David. This is what he'll do with you. Man, God's for you. He's on your side. It's not about what, how, how poorly we may have performed. God's ready to work with poor performance in order to raise it up and give you a liberty that you don't deserve, but you still have the right to receive. Amen. Lift a hand right up before God. Oh God, here we stand, men and women hungry for you. Here we stand in your holy presence. And you have the great plans for our life, the plan for our welfare, the plan for our healing, the plan for our deliverance, the plan for our restoration. And in the name of Jesus, all across this audience, we are receiving those plans, Lord. Said out loud, I receive, I receive your plan, Lord. Your plan, Lord. Plan for my restoration. Plan. The plan for my wholeness. For my wholeness. The plan for my healing. The plan for, my healing. For, long life. for long life. For a long satisfied life. For blessing. And I thank you, O oh God, oh God, that I am blessed. I am blessed. Because you hold righteousness up to me. You hold righteousness up to me. And see me in that light. Now, Father, I pray for these men and women that this night there is a culmination of things that you've said all this week that will break loose within us. So in Jesus' name, I declare to you, this is your night to be restored. This is your night to be made whole. This is your moment to be delivered from tumors, growths, lumps or bumps that don't belong in your body. That there is healing in this house. There is restoration for your soul. There is a moment in the presence of God now. That that heavy stuff that Satan's laid off on you lifts off you right this minute. Lift both hands before the Lord and say it again. I receive, I receive. in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Do you receive? Yes. Come on, shout a praise to God. We do receive.